Thank you. I want to invite um, both of you just to join me here for a few minutes. And uh, we have time for questions, reactions, comments. And I suggest you either direct them to both of our speakers or individually. So uh, the floor is open for comments or questions. I think this obviously go to both speakers. With the whole Muslim cartoon controversy, can you guys kind of explain, because I know in the media they were just like, well, Muslims are mad, and they didn't really explain, they didn't go into it about why we reacted the way we did. People were just saying, oh, well, they're extremists, and mm -hmm. just kind of getting the bad reputation we always have in the media. So you guys can kind of explain about that. Well, I think it was uh, most of the media. It got uh, much less play than it should have. It was a it was a more, much more complex story than it than it got in a lot of American coverage. It was, you know, the the the, the, the one minute or thirty second way they frame things, and you got footage of uh, people screaming, and they made sure they had all the signage of being looking Muslim, and uh, and then you know. Uh, Europeans in business suits. So that was the kind of iconography. Um, but it was much more complex. There were, uh, this has been covered, there's a, a book coming out by a, a Danish academic who was really at, uh, very involved, talking to the government, talking to uh, Muslims in Denmark. And he, uh, he gave a great talk at uh, AAR a couple of years a year ago, I guess in which he explored how complex the story was and how it involved a certain imam who was going to the Mideast and trying to engage uh, people there, how it involved uh, some, some very arrogant uh, um, academics and others in, in, uh, English, or in uh, Denmark. So there were uh, mistakes made all the way around and um, it wasn't simply Muslims hate images, these are images. Uh, and it got framed as a kind of freedom of press story, or it got framed as a Muslim iconoclasm story. But there were, it was, there was so much more. Uh, so it's the, it's the media's fault. It's an interesting case study, actually, because it does involve imagery, but it, it, it also involves religious views about imagery. It involves national identity and, and, and uh, religious identity. But there's also other issues of, of sort of clash of enlightenment values versus people who um, don't espouse those values and so forth. I think a similar incident was the sensations exhibit at the Brooklyn Museum where people were, pe people were offended by some of the images that were shown in that show. And what strikes me is a lot of them didn't even see it. They had never been to the show. So it was, really wasn't about images as such. It was about blasphemy and ideas of, of religious identity that were at stake. It's a really interesting kind of case study. All the way in the back. Yeah, you showed us different um, images of Jesus portrayed by um, like Indians in a Hindu form. What is the majority opinion within Christians about doing that? About portraying Jesus as... As other than what, say, a Western white majority is? Right, like, you know, like, he almost looks like Shiva. Like, mm -hmm. what does the majority of Christian people think about portraying him like that? I don't think there is a majority of Christian people. If there is, I don't know if there's a voice. I mean, you've got white Catholics, black Catholics, uh, Hispanic, uh, Pentecostal. I mean, it's just, it's such a varied... I mean, one can't generalize about Muslims or about Christians. I mean, they're, um, I mean, it just, you, it, and I think the best social analysis of these situations are, uh, are these phenomena are when uh, scholars focus on a particular community, work up its history, get there and talk to people. Don't just, you know, go to some encyclopedia and read about what is Christianity, what is Islam, but talk to people and don't just talk to the priests or the imams. Uh, get in there and interview and, and, and uh, enter a world that isn't your own, that's incredibly complex, that's full of contradictions. I mean, even within a single community, even among, say, Muslim women, 
in Los Angeles, you're going to find a, a huge range of opinion. Uh, so, I mean, if your question is more about what has, say, theological tradition, what has learned tradition been, um, uh, it's still quite diverse. Uh, but you can you can perhaps be more generalizing, say, about what certain kinds of Protestants have thought versus certain kinds of, uh, say, Catholic or Orthodox. Um, in which case, there is um, uh, a real the the comes down often to: Are you giving away the store? Are you attempting to accommodate so much that you lose your identity in the process to? Uh, create this connection. That, that seems to be the sort of um, flashpoint. In, in, in our research, we found that, for example, the Orthodox would be most, the most opposed to that because their images are canonically stipulated, because they are a part of the tradition, and the tradition is, is, is a sacred tradition. Um, whereas Protestants probably would be fairly open to, to this kind of, because Protestants are interested in contextualizing the, Catholics were sort of somewhere in between. They, they wouldn't be necessarily opposed, but it, it doesn't cohere with religious imagery that they're used to. Because when you say imagery to Catholics, they usually think traditional Catholic imagery, which they've been raised with. So they're sort of, okay, but maybe a little uncomfortable. Well, that was actually Mary beside Jesus, oh, but Mary, other people sorry. wanted it to be Jesus, but were offended <laughs> when they found it. <laughs> okay. But um, has anyone, or do you know much about um, Catholic Actually, written on uh, the indigenization of theology and, and, and African is, is perhaps, uh, and I'm not an expert, but uh, the stuff I see coming out of Africa is perhaps the most um, ambitious and sophisticated theologically. I'm sure it's happening around the world. There, there's a whole growing field of called comparative theology that's dealing with this, and, and um, I, I, it's not a field that I'm really up on, but I know. Francis Clooney, for example, of Harvard is one of the leading figures in that, who does, for example, a comparison theologically between some of the imagery of, of, of the Hindu goddesses and the Virgin Mary, and, and trying to ask theologically how these are similar or different in, in terms of the, the worshipers of these two faiths. So it's a very interesting field, actually, and it's somewhat new. And I have a, a chapter in a book uh, uh, called the, the Sacred Gaze, and uh, you can, uh, I cite Bill, oh, I, uh, and there's a lot of literature there. It's not my field either, but I'm fascinated by this. I, I think it's the fifth chapter, and it looks just at what role images have played at different cultural moments of, of encounters between believers of one tradition and, and believers of another. their imagination is formed and they may engage in other cultures that they often feel comfortable coming back. And I'd like to um, put that with our experience at the Getty and the icon visit from Mount Sinai that I was at the opening and we had the mayor and archbishops and leaders of you know every major tradition were there. And the Getty had to accommodate that so many people came from all over the world as a religious pilgrimage and they venerated, you know, touched the glass, bowed, kissed, and so we had, um, and I was there many times, the simultaneous experiences of the Orthodox appropriating from their religious imagination a relationship as a family portrait of a revered relative. And then there were other believers who came and also had a, you know, a sense of spiritual engagement, but from their own religious imagination. So I think it's a very exciting time and it showed the hunger that people have for a sense of connectedness to the divine. That also raises the question of the museum space being a separate space from sort of 
worship spaces. And usually we try to keep those in our culture distinct because there's a certain kind of expectation uh, that, that's aroused by galleries and museum spaces that's different than particular worship spaces. But for some people, that's really hard. I mean, it's famous in, in, in Latino cultures. You, you can't put up altars in a museum and not expect people to come and light candles. I mean, it just won't happen because they don't make distinction between those kinds of spaces. But um, in our sort of modern, uh, social diff socially differentiated culture, we've made such a distinction between these kinds of spaces. I think it's a great, uh, we've been looking for someone to write about this uh, in material religion. Uh, and we were actually trying to find somebody to write about the Getty show because we heard this was going on. There you go, Leah. You uh, do it. It's a great, uh, great topic. Uh, it, because in a way, I mean, uh, museums uh, were, um, are often, many of them, at least classically, were uh, either palaces or church-like spaces, sacred yeah. spaces, chapel-like. Yeah. And there's a kind of sacrality to a museum. So, if you put an icon there, I mean, why wouldn't a, uh, an Orthodox believer be deeply disposed to reverence this object? And it's exciting in museology today. I, I think a lot of curators and museum directors get this, and they're 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 um, you know they're not trying to push those things off to the side. Uh, they're they're being more creative. I, I was on a panel with a curator, and she was expressing how they really seriously had a, a major struggle to accommodate these different, on the one hand, they wanted to welcome people. In fact, they made the space, if any of you went, one of the spaces looked somewhat like, somewhat like a, a chapel, but they wanted to accommodate people who are coming to look at it as art and not feel as though this was a proselyting experience or anything. But so they really, they really struggled with how to accommodate these different, these different audiences. It's very interesting. That's a great question, and it, 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 it changes uh, depending on where you are. In the States, uh, I think the Harlem Renaissance was probably the tipping point, the turning point, where uh, black intellectuals, black artists, black poets started talking publicly and writing about Christ as a black man. Um, and you see some of the, I think, first examples of it coming out of, in, in, by black artists. But they're intellectuals, and they're kind of on the margins. When does it enter mainstream American black culture? I think the 60s was, was pivotal. I, I think it's 60s, 70s when, uh, and there are examples. Uh, Carter, the guy I showed you, was, was uh, working in the late 60s and 70s, creating black Christs, being beaten sometimes by whites. Well, I showed that one. Being beaten by white Roman soldiers, you know, who looked very Caucasian versus uh, his suffering black. So, I mean, you can situate his work within race, American race relations very interestingly. And then like for Africa, you know, well, have you seen a difference in... Yeah, missionaries, I think missionaries by, by the middle of the century and toward the end of the century, I, John, your, your, your visual image pro project probably has a lot to say about this, but discovered anthropology and discovered sort of indigenous uh, principles and so encouraged local production of imagery. What's interesting is that my research showed that the people who were often opposed to it were not the missionaries, but were the national Christians themselves initially. Because this wasn't, this wasn't really Christian. This wasn't, so, so ironically, so that there, sometimes people were on opposite sides from what you would expect them to be in this, in this whole issue. Uh, but it's it is generational. It's, it's, it's somewhat, maybe it's generational. I was, I was That's in Ethiopia true. Yeah. interviewing Protestant artists, Ethiopians, and there were three generations. The old generation that was the first to get missionized were disgusted, bothered, <laughs> not publicly, but when we talked to them privately, by the return of drums, 
to the church by, yeah. the, by yeah. the use, by the search for a black iconography. They said, what? Jesus was an African. I mean, you, come on. What, what are we trying to make him look like an African? They, they, yeah. But the younger you went, the more uh, proactive they were about drums, about uh, African dance and music, indigenous culture being brought back to the church. So yeah. it, it's fascinating. Now, what about niche groups? Because we know the representation of the Christ child is very different from the representation of Christ as a Messiah because we knew, know that his ministry began much after he was a child. But there is this tale by Oscar Wilde where um, there's a child appearing and then recognized by the prince of nails on his palms. So there have been such representations throughout literature. So are there such uh, newer representations of the Christ child as such? We have seen the Christ on the cross so far. Christ on the cross as a child? No, no. Uh, I mean, has the representation of the Christ as a child also undergone oh. similar transfiguration? Yeah, it's really powerful in um, several Catholic traditions. Um, I'm trying to think of much variation over time. Uh, actually, I'm not. I mean, if you, as you go from one country to another, you find Christ as a child looking like he's a, like a small adult. Um, some of the German traditions really make him look like a pudgy little infant. Uh, so the, 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 there are, there's great variety within the depiction of Christ as a child, and it's key to certain various pieties, pieties that stress tenderness versus those that stress you know, the kind of supernatural authority of the incarnate child. You, you, definitely, and and in in especially in Protestant churches, there's a lot of use of video in in worship. There's there's congregations that use video every week in various ways, and film clips. That's a huge thing right now. So yes, definitely, the video is a is a is a huge thing. It's an evolving thing. It's it's still somewhat experimental. So that one can't say that there's really a, a sort of a tradition there that, that sort of ties it to anything theologically, uh, but but there's definitely something to keep one's eye on, and you know I try to do that. Although I'm not I usually an uh, I usually take pot shots at Vol uh, Walter Benjamin's notion this aura being dissipated by mass-produced imagery. How in fact how that's not true if you look at still imagery. Uh, all kinds of Protestants, for instance, have very fond, and Catholics have very fond relationships, devotional relationships with images, mass-produced, cheap little lithographs. But what's interesting is when you go to film or video, uh, there I think Benjamin's right for certain kinds of conservative Protestants, traditional evangelical Protestants, who are nervous about still images being too much like Catholic or Orthodox imagery. Film they love because... Yeah. For them, often if you talk to them, it's as if, and I, I interviewed a lot of evangelicals after the Passion of the Christ show, it's as if the medium vanishes. Yeah. And they're there. They, and they will use categories of presence, and talking about presence. film. Yeah. And it's fascinating um, uh, how that works. Uh, so th yeah. th that's one of the most interesting aspects of visual culture uh, as received among many Christians, I think. I have a question actually related to your question. And one of the major revolutions within the last 30 years in the U.S. is clearly the growth of these mega churches, which oftentimes you know, are in warehouses or they're the sort of box-like churches with no stained glass, no iconography, no images. But they do have a lot of the new media, just as Bill was mentioning. But there also seems to be an interesting emergent trend of folks getting tired of the blandness of these very sterile environments and then running off to the Episcopal Church <laughs> or the Catholic Church yeah. or actually joining Orthodox churches yeah. Oh, yeah. and sort of uh, 
finding in the smoky incense and the dim lights and so forth a different kind of spirituality. So I guess my question is, I mean, it's both sort of an observation, but maybe a question about do you see cultural trends emerging here in the U.S., maybe elsewhere also, that might be pushing even um, Presbyterians, Bill happens to be a Presbyterian, you know, into uh, or maybe back into a place where you can literally feel and experience a tradition. Well, this is, this is where within traditions there's a great deal of movement, tensions, quarreling going on, obviously. And one of the things that, in fact, David helped me with this in, in something I'm working on, he talks about the sort of cultural of immediacy, that, that the idea that, that faith should be a kind of immediate experience and that you should have a worship experience that has a sort of sense of immediacy to it. Well, that lends itself to the use of particular kinds of art and uses of tradition, but it, but it impedes a sort of accessing of more staid kind of traditional forms. So it seems to me as long as you're in that mode of, of, of faith being something that has to be sort of constantly renewed, that you have to be constantly sort of on a kind of freshness to it. A lot of people say I struggle every day, every Sunday I go to church to try to focus my attention to be fresh and all that. As long as, as that is your worship mode, well then arts will have to take that kind of surprising, shocking, just to sort of uh, help you out there. Uh, but but the people, they get tired of that. And they say, I want to go back to the tradition. I miss the tradition. I miss the, the depth of the history. And so then they, they either go back to what they grew up with or they, they convert. Has there been uh, sociological work done on life course for religious members? Uh, on, I mean, the, the uh, sort of... Uh, Skeptical uh, take would be, well, this is just uh, uh, the latest version of religious consumerism. Yeah. You know, you're shopping for religion because you feel like, you know, Episcopalian this week and Baptist next. Uh, but uh, I think that's too glib, yeah, it and is. it would be much more interesting yeah. uh, to construct research programs that look at religious affiliation over time. Over time. Yeah. As part of a much more, um, as a, as a, a part of a larger ecology, you know, we, people change, and there are probably fascinating patterns to that change over the course of, of uh, time a life of a life cycle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Let's take one more question, and then um, we should probably break, and then I have a very brief announcement after that. Too quick. Um, we'll take two questions. <laughs> uh, Yes, go ahead. Scott and then All right. Um, the question is, how do each of the traditions, if you pay attention to it, view the role of the image maker? Uh, Which two are you talking about? The subject or the object, object, but the image makers, the painters, the sculptors, the photographers, how, how are they viewed in this whole process of veneration? Well, you know, what I found is it's really interesting how, how important the spiritual life of the image maker is to the Protestants. They were always talking about, well, the artist that did this work got up and they gave their testimony. It was such a blessing to me, you know, and so that it, that really enhanced the experience with the image because it, it gave some sense and a level of authenticity to it. Of course, the Orthodox have institutionalized that because the process of doing icons is a spiritual discipline. It's a spiritual process that one learns from a, from a vocation. it's a vocation that one learns from a theological mentor and so forth. But I found that interesting. Mm -hmm. Jeff, last question, and then we'll have a brief announcement from Okay, um, there's a lot of celebration of the diversity of images here. There are, however, and the question about the certain images that are considered to cross the line. I wonder if you think there's a, a, a credible, definable notion of visual blasphemy. Blasphemy is normally defined as a crime of words. Um, and yet, obviously, a cartoon of Mohammed carrying a bomb seems to be visually blasphemous. Um, I had some paintings at the Bauer Art Museum in Santa Ana from Vietnam where it was alleged you could see Buddha's genitalia. Uh, so there are images that, that seem to cross a line. Hmm. And um, That's really I'm just wondering if there's, if there's a way to define that process. I'd be interested in hearing Yeah, that's yeah, great. Uh, there was uh, 
for instance, one of the images, the uh, Muhammad images, showed him his turban as a bomb. And it wasn't just that he was wearing a bomb. You know, you could argue, well, that's because, uh, I mean, somebody, some people in the media did say, well, that, that's not really maligning Islam. It's maligning the terrorist appropriation of Islam. Well, for people who read Arabic, it was indeed blasphemous because the text, the calligraphic text, came from the black covering of the, uh, the, the famous uh, Kaaba, uh, where the Hajj ends. And, and, and this is an incredibly holy site. So blasphemy, yeah, there is the common word thing, but blasphemy is when you take something that's sacred and drag it through the mud. And you do it for provocative or more just ideological reasons. I guess they're the same thing. And in that case, it's very hard not to see that as utterly blasphemous uh, because it's no longer political critique. It is eye poking, you know, which is, I think, violence in that, symbol, even symbolic violence, can be meaningfully distinguished in many cases from, from uh, um, ideological or, or from uh, what? legitimate political critique, even though we won't agree with what that is. That's a really interesting question. Is there is there such a thing as visual visual blasphemy? Because it seems to me it's so hard to disentangle the image from its setting, and even using the the words of the Hajj and all indicate that it's that is what was blasphemous. It's more the idea, and I wonder what percentage of those rioting at that actually actually saw it, or whether they they heard about it, and that was enough. Well, in other words, whether the blasphemer was simply an idea. And certainly that was the case in Sensations. It was the idea that was blasphemous. It wasn't really necessarily the imagery. But the imagery certainly triggers it, so you can't dismiss that as being unimportant. So that's a really more research. OK, let's thank our two guests. who's done a lot of work on this event and two more that she'll tell you about. Uh, these are actually very exciting field trip oriented. So tell us what they are. So yeah, that's the great news. This is only the first part of the park series. And for the next two events, we're going to be taking you off campus. If you are a few feet, it's free. Um, and on October 20th, the first one is going to be to Shilai Temple, Hacienda Heights. And that is a Buddhist temple. And it's the largest Buddhist temple in North America. And it's the only one, as far as I know, that is run by women, correct? And the second one is to the um, Lacquer Museum to, um, for a presentation with the curator there, Linda Komarov. And after that, we'll be going to the Islamic Center um, for a dinner discussion with um, Jihad Turk, who will be doing a discussion about uh, current Islamic issues. And that one is on November 16th. So please RSVP, transportation is free and we highly encourage you to join us. And there's more information in the back, and Vision Voices also has more information in the back about other events that they have planned, so please feel free to take more uh, flyers. Thank you. And we do need your RSVP because of transportation issues, but there is no expense. So thank you very much for coming.